So if you've been watching the show for almost nine years now, you know that my favorite type of car is the one that makes no business sense whatsoever. For example, a car that is impractical, a car that will leave you on the side of the road at least twice a year, or a car that other sane people would look at and say, I have no idea why on God's green earth that thing exists. Well, contrary to popular belief, they don't always have to be built in a shed in the southeast of England. For example, they could be a low volume derivation of a low volume large luxury sedan that is very expensive, has two less doors, and the roof chopped off. So today, let's you and I drive an unusual suspect that to any rational car company around the world makes no business sense whatsoever. Okay, so I am well aware that you have seen this car before in the S63 episode, but now let's focus back on this engine to understand the similarities as well as the differences between what motivates an S560 and an S63. Let's start with the similarities. First and foremost is the size. Uh, they're both four liters in displacement, both V8s. Uh, second is they both have two turbochargers strapped to them, and third, those turbochargers are packaged in the V. Then what's not similar is kind of the elephant in the room, and that's the output. In this case, it's 463 horsepower, comes in at 5,250 RPM, stays flat up to 5,500 RPM. Then there's the torque, 516 pounds of torque, comes in at 2,000 RPM, stays flat all the way up to 4,000 RPM. Then there's a major change, and I would argue it's a little bit better in this case, in that the power only goes to the rear wheels, and that is only in the case of the convertibles, not the coupes. And that's going through a nine-speed automatic transmission. Now, you're probably thinking, well, the S63, that's got a nine-speed automatic as well. Well, there's a difference there. It's the difference between two clutches in the S63, and this has a standard torque converter. Uh, then there's an important thing I want to bring up here. Uh, if you are a Mercedes like aficionado, you know this used to be a 4.7 V8. And one would say, if you read many car magazines, well, they made that change because of China. Well, it's not just because of China. It's because of many tax schemes around the world, probably manufacturing as well, but we're going to put that aside. Uh, in the Aston Martin V8, a DB11 V8 episode uh, that has this very engine, I shared a couple of examples of tax schemes around the world to give you a reason why most manufacturers, not just Mercedes, Mercedes, Ferrari, McLaren, are all coming out with engines like this that are under four liters. Technically, this is 3982 in displacement, not four liters. So go and take a look at that. And oh, by the way, one of you guys, one of the viewers from Turkey, and you guys know I love going through Istanbul on my European trips, so you should be following me on Instagram so you can see some great pictures from Istanbul. Anyway, one of the viewers, he shared the ridiculous tax scheme in Turkey, and now I understand why I see nothing but crappy old Fiat's on the road there. Okay, so welcome to one of the most stunning views in all of Los Angeles. High atop the Palos Verdes Peninsula, you can see over to the Santa Monica Mountains, downtown Los Angeles, over there, into Hollywood, Santa Monica. It's one of the most pretty places to hike also one of the most pretty places to live. And this is absolutely one of the spots you would find a car like this. So with that, let's take somewhat of a leisurely drive in the natural habitat of most S560s, especially a convertible S560. Okay, now that we're at the bottom of the hill here, let's put our foot into it. We've got a bit of an elevation change, but not too much because this is a nice neighborhood and there's plenty of power. Remember, this is power only going to the rear wheels. And it's not the S63, but it, it, you know, it's, it's still a fast car. That's the very funny thing about it. Even only at four, only 463 horsepower, put our foot into it with somewhat of a steep hill, there's no hesitation whatsoever. To the point where you can make very quick work of some traffic, like we've got a slow moving pickup truck in the left lane, so let's pass him, put our foot into it on an elevation change with a nice turn here. But what's incredibly important to understand as we get back to the top of the hill here, the power comes in at any point in the power band. So it's not like there's peaks and valleys with the two turbochargers. It's tuned to deliver power, I'd say under about 2,000 RPM. Like here we are coasting at about 
50 miles an hour. I want to pass these cyclists here because they've been rude all morning. And it barely has to go over 2,000 RPM to pick up a good amount of speed. Now, granted, on the freeway or in the canyons, it would be something different, but I would argue this is not the kind of car we're going to bring to the canyons. Unlike that S63, this is a bit of a boulevard cruiser. Yes, it's built from the same platform of multi-link suspensions and all that kind of stuff, but let's put that aside and talk about what really makes this car work, and that is it's an air ride setup. And the air ride setup has been changed a little bit for the 2018 model year. A, it's standard. Uh, B, it does more. There is curve control in the convertibles in the US now. Uh, and then see the wheels are a bit smaller than we're on that S63. It's an 18 inch wheel as opposed to a 20 inch wheel. So this is a bit more supple in the way it drives. And at the end of the day, it's going to be something you're going to see in Beverly Hills or the King's Road or basically, well, the King's Road is going to be a very nice day. So very rare days you would see this on the King's Road. Anyway, I digress. Let's take it out to California roads and see how it works. So now let's you and I slow down a bit and use this thing for its intended purpose, which is driving around fancy neighborhoods. It doesn't really get much fancier than this. And there's some little twists, turns here. We're not going to go too fast. Uh, right now I've got it in my individual mode, which is economy on the engine and full fat sport on everything else. Okay, so we have a perfect use case here. I uh, get to the bottom of the hill, nice little uphill turn. Let it coast a bit to the bottom, put our foot into it, no brakes. Please don't try this at home. And there's a, there's a slight lean over there. It's composed, but a slight lean. Okay, so as the road gets tighter, it's something really important to understand. And this is not just driving this thing today, but the time I've had with it over the past week. You get in this thing, especially after an S63 and M5, it has a completely different personality. It may be almost that powerful, but that's a bit misleading because the personality of this thing is one of more comfort even in its most sport, sport plus setting. That's the takeaway. You and I are at the point where we need to just dispense with our usual exercise of how does it drive or look at that technical engine or the bits that make up the driving dynamics. That's not what this thing is about. This is exquisite to behold. And I don't mean for the usual reasons like build quality. It's how this very car here is presented. I would not be the first one to select white on white, but at least when it's new, it works and works ridiculously well. Like for example, the white seats with the contrasting piping and the contrast stitching and then two-tone interior with the blue door panels, blue carpeting and the burled walnut wood dash. Then the Burmester speaker grills that have been pilfered from the sedan, but not just like straight from there to here. They've been adapted for this specific application to work in conjunction with the seat belt presenters and then add to the tanu cover as some pageantry of display of color and jewelry. I know I sound like I'm a, a wedding planner the way I'm presenting this thing, but look, even the leading edge of the A-pillar looks like it's something to behold. I, I, I think I need some time alone with this thing because it's, it's not just all of the bits I just pointed out. This very car here has a ridiculous amount of options and not just the design, you know, interior. It has the heads up display it has night vision, which I love me some night vision, because who doesn't want military technology in their Palm Beach car? And then last but not least, Sawarski crystal headlights. And it's not just the headlights that change. When one of these is outfitted with Sawarski crystal headlights, the door to the front cup holders has a crystal handle. So coming down Hawthorne Boulevard from the top of the Palos Verdes Peninsula, 
passing a, a wretched Acura crossover. But out there is Catalina. The little uh, notch in the center is the Isthmus. Uh, that is uh, the PV practice area where I do a lot of my practice flying. And there's wonderful whale watching out there. This is just one of the most stunning places in all of Southern California to be because, yeah, you get the feel of the Pacific Ocean, but you also get the height to kind of look down and survey the natural beauty of Southern California. Uh, there's a nice little tidbit, actually two things. Um, there is the Abalone Cove, which you would go there and you can see these tide pools. So it's a wonderful place to take people who are from out of town and you get this natural beauty that's still in Metro Los Angeles. Uh, and then there's the Swedenborgian Chapel out there, which was in a previous episode. Did some guerrilla filming to get that to happen. But it's this amazing architecture, the structure of the place uh, was, actually was designed to take advantage of the, the local topography. So it's literally like an indoor outdoor structure. Uh, something if you're either living in LA, make the trek down here, or if you're visiting in LA, definitely come and see it. Okay, so now we're at the bottom of the PV Peninsula looking over to the Pacific Ocean here and great spot for a couple of notes. First and foremost is using this thing as a convertible in more than ideal weather. I know it's funny saying that living in Southern California. Uh, and this is not specific just to the S-Class, but there's a combination, like a suite of open air technologies. There's this wind blocker that comes up over and out of the A-pillar, which works in conjunction with the wind blocker in the back. And this is like old school. I remember I had a, a Z3 and then a Z3M, which I put this thing over the roll bars. And that's like one of the first applications when those things were in there. But now the wind comes over the top of the A-pillar, over the people in the back seat, and then it doesn't buff it back into the car. Then that works in conjunction with obviously the heated seat and whatever you set here. But then the last trick is a heated neck warmer. So the upshot of all of this in practice, and let's call it the moving warming hut old technologies for when you absolutely gotta positively put the roof down when it's too cold outside, is this all works in conjunction to lower the threshold. Let's say like your mother or your girlfriend is really the threshold and the lowest you could put the, the top down with them is, I'll make it up, 65 degrees. With this, you could probably go down to 55 degrees. If it's just you, you could go down to 40 degrees. And with that, there was no way we could drive this thing without putting the roof up and you can see why it is a stunning place to be on the inside. It's an Alcantara headliner. Everything is finished to a T. It is also usability, like it is rather quiet in here. Even when it's been raining outside, granted it's not as quiet as that S63 was, uh, but still amazing for a convertible. And this is coming from someone who's owned many convertibles. And then last and certainly not least, but not specific just to this convertible, the steering wheel, which we looked at in the S63 and here it's the same, maybe it doesn't have AMG in this one. Uh, but I finally noticed something in using it now for say more than two weeks. Uh, all of the buttons are here, which means there's something very big missing. Remember Mercedes-Benz from like the 70s, they started using stalks for everything, cruise control and all sorts of other functions that were knobs and that kind of stuff. The stalks, they're gone. They're nowhere to be found. Instead, they've been replaced with these like buttons. They look pretty, but then they've got this like haptic feedback thing from like an iPhone. I don't care about haptic feedback. I want stalks, things that, that work when I look this way. I don't have to look this way. Let's think of this as like an open letter to the, 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 the UX designers. Whoever from Mercedes changed this, change it back. You had perfection from the 70s. Keep it that way. So I have this theory about the folks from Stuttgart. They've always had this reputation for utility, dependability, and engineered to a standard. But when the roof got chopped off, those all kind of didn't go out the window, but they became secondary to something far more important, and that is artistry. Enter exhibit A. 
elegant yet understated at exactly the same time. And I would argue that the high watermark was the 280 SE 3.5, which was a doctor's car back in the day, but today is a blue chip collectible that's worth a couple hundred grand and only going up. And that is the backdrop as to why this, the S560 convertible, exists today. And I would further argue that the artistry it went away in the 80s because there was no 560 SEC convertible. And while Bruno Sacco's design of the 1990 SL was stunning and it is timeless today, it was more about the trick top and the technology than it was about the artistry. And it's with this and only with this that the artistry is back to the point where it's the proportion of a four seat convertible which doesn't exist elsewhere. And then going backwards to a cloth top, it's, let me put it this way. It's not a GT3, it's not a Lotus, but I still want one very badly. Most likely I would prefer one with a V12, but the measly four liter. 463 horsepower twin turbo V8 will do very nicely, thank you. So um, with that, I have nothing more to say. Until I see you next time, bis später.